Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar from the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and welcome to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN, a show that brings to you teaching about divine mercy, people living mercy in their lives, inspiring stories, readings from the Diary of St. Faustina, the Bible, and much more. You know, last Sunday, we started the season of Advent. And Advent is Latin for to come to, which is a period beginning with the Sunday nearest the feast of St. Andrew the Apostle on November 30th and continuing for four consecutive Sundays. It begins a brand new year in the church calendar. So happy new year. You know, while we always think of Advent as a preparation for Christmas, it actually prepares for three comings of Christ. Yes, first, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, the incarnation. The second is the second coming of Christ at the end of time, called eschatology. And finally, the coming of Jesus daily into our hearts through Holy Communion. So, how do we prepare for these comings of Christ? Well, by reducing the amount that we are filled with ourselves. Thus, Advent is a time of prayer and fasting, basically a time of penance and reforming our life similar to what we do in Lent. And that is why priests wear purple on both seasons. Although in Lent, we really should wear more of a Roman purple, which is a reddish color for blood. And in Advent, we wear more of a royal purple, they call it, or more of a bluish purple representing Mary. Now, so back to the reason for the Advent season, prayer and penance. Advent originated as a 40-day fast in preparation for Christmas, kind of like Lent is before Easter. Now, fasting, which, believe it or not, is a practice older than Christmas itself, it used to be mandatory, and it was even recommended by Jesus himself. And this is a way for the spirit to control the flesh. That's what fasting does, not the other way around, the flesh controlling the spirit. This is something we must do. The spirit must be in control in order for us to get to heaven. So it's very important. But something often forgotten about fasting is that it also produces in us a sense of longing. When we fast, our bodies clamor for what we have willingly given up, be it food or entertainment or other goods. So rather than responding with indulgence, which many of us do, we can respond with prayer. We can say, Lord, hasten to fill the emptiness within me this Christmas as I know only you can fully satisfy these longings of my soul. So we empty ourselves and Christ fills us. You know, during Lent, we usually fast from things like chocolate, soda, or movies. But in Advent, it's also good to make some sort of sacrifice for God. It doesn't have to be something material. It could be giving up complaining or gossiping or talking badly about other people. Or maybe you can give some of your time or resources to help other people who are in need. Remember, we give of our time, treasure, and talents. So, as a penitential season, this is why marriages do not normally occur during Lent and Advent, which is surprising to some people. But that doesn't make penance bad. All right, the the penance of Lent, for instance, prepares for the joy of Easter. And the penance of Advent prepares for the joy of Christmas. However, there is one Sunday of joyful celebration in both Lent and Advent. We have Gaudate Sunday, which means rejoice, on the third Sunday of Advent. And in Lent, we have Latare Sunday, which is the fourth Sunday in Lent. Both are marked by the priest wearing rose, not pink, colored vestments. You know, and most people, when we talk about these seasons, most people think of early December, which is now Advent, as we said, as part of Christmas, a time of buying gifts so you're ready for Christmas Day. They think it's a preparation in that way. No. Advent ends, actually, on December 24th and is an entirely separate season from Christmas itself. As we said, 
We are to be preparing for the coming of Jesus, not just the preparing for Christmas decorations. You know, the Christmas season actually starts, not ends, on Christmas Day. That's the beginning of Christmas. This is when we should actually have our Christmas decorations out. But one decoration we should have during Advent is the Advent wreath. It is the shape of a circle, which symbolizes eternity because God has no beginning or no end. It is also a crown for victory with the prickly holly being like the thorns on Christ's crown. And we also use evergreen because it's always green. It doesn't die, evergreen. And so it represents immortal life, never ending. And then finally, we have the flame of the candles because Christ is the light of the world. And the purple, which the, the most uh, three of the four candles are, represents repentance and waiting. And we have one rose candle, too, we don't want to forget, as we said on the third Sunday, representing joy, because Christ's coming is close, only one week away. Now, Jesus tells us clearly how to avoid making the same mistake that people did in Noah's day. He says, stay awake to remain always vigilant and alert for his return so that we might never fall asleep spiritually and be caught off guard. Therefore, a good confession of our sins during Advent is strongly recommended. While the church, true, teaches that we are only required to technically go to confession only once a year, we Marians recommend monthly or at least during Lent and once during Advent in case the Lord calls you home. Let's not forget the reason for the season, which is not about material goods. Christ our Savior came once to redeem us. Now he'll come again at the end of time to reconcile all creation back to God. So let's be prepared, and Advent is the way to do that. Now let's talk to a friend of our Marian community named Teresa Tamio. You know, when I was used to live in Detroit, Teresa was the Channel 7 anchor on 7 Action News, and I never thought that I'd be working with her one day in spreading divine mercy. And she's a great example of preparing our hearts daily to receive Christ in our life, especially through Holy Communion and living divine mercy. Teresa Tamio is an author, syndicated Catholic talk show host, and motivational speaker. From the very beginning, she knew the type of work she was destined to do. From the time I was eight or nine years old, I knew I was going to be a broadcasting. God just put it on my heart. And the sisters at my grade school encouraged me, probably because they didn't know what else to do with me because I talked all the time. Teresa climbed the ladder of success, but as she got near the top, she realized she'd left some important things behind. I had found myself uh, at the height of my career, but in terms of my personal life, it was in a shambles. My marriage was on the rocks. Uh, I was living a very worldly life. I had fallen away from my Catholic faith. And the first inclination I had that something was wrong was when I was fired from a very prominent position. Overnight, I went from being at the top of my game to the next day walking out of the TV studios in suburban Detroit with a box in my hand and realizing that I'd sacrificed everything for this career of mine. And i never forget this. I was standing in line at the unemployment office in suburban Detroit. I mean, of course, someone said, oh, aren't you Teresa Tomio? Didn't I see you on the news the other night? And I turned and I always had a quick wit and a quick response that I looked and I said, you know, people tell me I look like her all the time, but it's just a coincidence. But that moment in terms of the exalted being greatly humbled, that was key. Knocked me off my high horse. The next few months were a time of reckoning and reflection. I had to look myself in the mirror during the six months I was unemployed and really think about what I had done. Because I knew, I knew I wasn't living my Catholic faith. I was just having way too much fun, you know, being a news person, being a news anchor and reporter and going here, there and everywhere uh, and ignoring my responsibilities as a wife, my responsibilities at home. My job was my whole life. So that suffering is, was an awakening for me. So the suffering was key. You could either embrace it and ask the Lord to take it and do something with it, or it can turn you into a very bitter, angry person. Thanks be to God, I had a husband who was very supportive and had had his own reversion to the Catholic faith. 
And I think if he hadn't been there, I might have gone in that other direction. Can you guess what happened when she turned back to God for guidance? And so that started me on a journey back to, slowly back to the Catholic Church. And God did put me back on the air at Channel 7, uh, the ABC affiliate in Detroit. And even though here I was on this big station thinking that, okay, now this is God's place me. I've had my reversion. I'm healing my marriage. I'm back in the church. I'm an on fire Catholic Christian. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to, you know, change the, the, the newsroom and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to die here at this station in my hometown. This is going to be great. I'm happy. I don't have to do anything else. That's what I thought, right? Well, God was not through with me yet. Finally, after a heartfelt cry for help, an unmistakable message. I got it out and then I was silent. And I heard, I cannot use you in the secular media anymore. It was so profound that I turned and expected to see the Lord sitting there. I knew in my heart that it was God telling me, okay, this is part of the journey, but the journey isn't done yet. So that was very significant where I had a distinct message that I wasn't going to be working in the secular media for very long, but I fought it. I fought it for a good three years. I went and took a job as a radio news director and had one foot in the Catholic world and one foot in the secular world thinking I could, I could do both. And finally in the year 2000, another you know, significant moment, I just said, you know what, I, I'm just, I just can't do it anymore. I just walked away not knowing, but I didn't care. It was like, okay, whatever, Lord. And then gradually, he led me here to Ave Maria Radio. I wear many hats. Uh, I am uh, primarily a Catholic uh, syndicated talk show host on an international show co-produced by Ave Maria Radio and EW Tan. It's a daily program, two hours, and I just love it. I've been doing that for um, almost 20 years now, believe it or not. What's happening from the pro-life perspective and a big story that continues to develop. There's been a, a, a total change in my life, a, a total refocus with uh, my faith being first. In addition to that personal relationship with Christ, a relationship with Christ in the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church has what we say, the fullness of faith, and it's so deep and it's so rich. And I want people to know what I've discovered along the way about the Catholic Church. It's all about Jesus now, and what happens, happens. He's got my life in his hands. And I think it's, it's all about trust, too. That's where the divine mercy comes in. Jesus, I trust in you. Do I really? Do we really trust in him? And that's another point about our faith that I really try to, to get across in all my work. So I, I feel my role is a defender of the faith as well as an evangelizer of the faith. And that's what's changed me. It's encouraging, especially for women in this day and age, because we're so inundated with so much about career, career, career. Everything's gotta be you know, about me, myself, and I. And we've been lied to. We've been lied to about birth control. We've been lied to about our identity. We've been lied to about relationships, about sexuality. And so I'm hoping that my example as someone who was in the world for a really, really long time and can have this total change, I hope that's encouraging. And yet still have fun, still live life to the fullest. You know, I'm not one to walk around in sackcloth and ashes. I mean, that's not a good look for me. You know, I mean, I like my bling and I like my color and I like to look nice for the Lord. I always say, put your best shoe your best foot and your best shoes forward for the Lord. That's why I wrote a book called Walk Softly and Carry a Great Bag. You know, being faithful does not mean we have to be frumpy. So there's this joy that comes along with being a faithful Catholic that I want people to understand because the world paints us as dowdy and, and that, you know, we have to walk around, oh, woe is me, you know, oh, I'm a Catholic, gotta go to mass, gotta go to confession. No, it's the joy of the Lord and you can be joyful. And that's what I'm hoping I'm, I'm helping people with and Divine Mercy is at the front and center. I actually spoke at Divine Mercy Sunday, which was just um, mind-blowing for me. I've actually been to the Divine Mercy Center in Poland, and I love the story of St. Faustina. I, I've done a lot of research on her. But for me, the, the Divine Mercy is all about trust. Jesus, I trust in you. And I think what our country, what our world has been through recently uh, with you know COVID, gave us a real pause in terms of do we really trust? So trying to get that message of trust, not that we minimize the issues that we have, but do we really trust what God says in Matthew 16, 18? At the gates of hell shall not prevail. You are Peter and on this rock, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Do we really believe that? I think with divine mercy, we can really look and look at what St. Faustina went through. That trust is so important, especially right now. It's just so interesting how God works in your life
Well, thank you, Teresa, for an inspiring story of somebody who had the courage to leave the secular world and bring their talents into the vineyard of God's uh, divine mercy and bringing this message to so many people. You know, it was funny because uh, I mentioned earlier, I used to watch Teresa Tamio on Channel 7 in Detroit, and I was speaking with her once at a conference. And I said during the conference that I used to watch Teresa when I was a kid, and she got up there and made the quick correction that I was at least in college so that we, <laughs> so that we didn't date ourselves but God bless her. And again, an honor to work with somebody who is out there helping us at Marian Fathers spread the message of divine mercy, a great friend of our Marian community. Now, we said also earlier that Advent is not just celebrating in preparation for the first coming of Jesus, but it's also a preparation for his second coming. Let us hear now what scripture has to tell us about this event called in our theology studies, eschatology. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. We should view our Lord's second coming with hope. In St. Luke's Gospel, Jesus finishes one of his prophecies of the end times with the words, Now when these things begin to take place, look up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Here in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus promises that he will return to earth with power and great glory to usher in the final triumph of God and gather his people safely into his eternal kingdom. That is why the early Christians pray with hope and expectation, come Lord Jesus. The Lord's final return to judge the earth will be a time of reckoning and a terrible day of justice for the wicked and impenitent. But for his disciples who are filled with trust in his merciful love, it will be a day of liberation and final homecoming. St. Faustina prays, Let the omnipotence of your mercy shield us from the darts of our salvation's enemies, that we may with confidence, as your children, await your final coming. For Jesus is our hope. Through his merciful heart, as through an open gate, we pass through to heaven. So there we have a great example of where Advent is in the Bible, and specifically regarding Christ's second coming. Now earlier we told you about Teresa Tamio, who worked for a major television network and now brings her talents into working for God. We have another story we want to share with you about somebody who's near and dear to me personally, and that is my right-hand man here at the Association of Marian Helpers, Kevin Doherty, the executive director. His story also is amazing about how he, working with also a major television network, gave up everything he had to come, trust in God, and now works in the vineyard, spreading the message of divine mercy. I started working for the Marians back in 1994, over 27 years now. I originally worked for a, um, a major television network in Manhattan, and I remember feeling at the time I was commuting two hours each way and taking a bus into the city. It was quite the commute and I was getting tired of it, and there was one moment when I was standing at a bus stop, freezing cold, and looking at another man standing there with me, and he was in his 50s at the time, I was in my 30s, and I thought, that can't be me. I won't be here standing in this freezing cold when I'm 50. So I knew I needed to change jobs, and I knew I needed to find a place to go. So I decided to you know, move up to the Berkshires where I had a friend who lived here. He also worked with me before, and I thought it was just a beautiful area, so we moved up here. It took me a while to find a job, but I did find a job with the uh, Marians. Uh, it was funny because when they actually called to offer me the job, um, 
My wife got the call at home and she had asked them to call me at my job in New York. And she said she got off the phone because she had been praying for me to get a job. And she looked up and she said, I've been praying and I know I've been bugging you. I didn't expect you to give him a job yourself. So I took the job with the Marians not knowing a thing about them. I started out at the Marians in their IT department. And I remember thinking it was a small department and I thought this isn't gonna be much of a job. And I remember the very first day I started working there, uh, my boss at the time came in and she dumped a stack of books on my desk and she said, you're, the now, you're now the uh, network administrator. And I was like, okay, I've never done this before, but that's great, something new. And, and it just took off from there. Each time I turned around, there was something new that I was doing, which was um, very exciting to me. About eight years ago is when, um, when they asked me to take on the job as the executive director when the former director, executive director retired. I was not, again, as I said before, not knowing who the Marians were, not knowing, I, mean, I would hear these terms, I would hear these names. I was in IT, it was you know, not really a job that I was involved with the uh, actual um, message and, and things that were being spread, but I was you know, working on it, be in meetings and I'd hear these names and I'd hear St. Faustina, or Sister Faustina at the time. I'd hear Stanislaus Papchinski, never knowing who they were or what they were. And my role here kind of, as it grew, took me into different places where I started to find out more and more about who these people were just by being at these meetings and seeing things that were written and starting to read things myself. So I started to, to see that, uh, you know, who Papchinsky was, the founder of the Marians. And from not even knowing who the man was and his name ended up being at his canonization, which totally blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is, talk about full circle, not even, knowing who he was. And with Sister Faustina, um, I had a similar experience too, where I was uh, not aware of who she was, learned about the diary, and there was a lot of push at that time to make her a saint. And so, you know, I started to get involved in that and started to feel more like I understood it and wanted to be a part of it, which was, was different for me. And I just remember one trip that I was on where I, we went to Lithuania and I was standing in a room which was at, that, or at one time was St. Faustina's bedroom. And I stood in this room and I'm looking at this area and I'm saying, wow, I'm standing right where probably Jesus stood as he spoke to her. And I got this chill down my body and I said, this is just totally amazing to be a part of this. One of the, the charisms that the Marian have, Marians have is the, uh, you know, uh, praying for the souls in purgatory. And it was kind of special to me because I, it was a few years ago I was praying the rosary. And before I started to pray, I thought to myself, let me just think about some of the, the um, family members who had passed away. And I, and I was remembering them and, you know, more closer to my, you know, my immediate family. So I started to pray the rosary. And while I was praying, these other names of family members that I hadn't thought of in years started popping into my head. And I was like, wow, okay, uh, so I'll just keep praying. And you know, I think of them and, and they would come into my head and then go out and another person would come in and then another person. It was just, and then friends of the family. It was just amazing to me. I, was, I couldn't even believe what was happening. So I was praying. And in the middle, this one aunt of mine kept coming into my, into my mind. And I was like, well, she's not dead, she's sick. So I said, you know, I, I just tried to ignore her and, and prayed on, and she kept coming into my head. And like I said, the other ones would just come and go, and she just would not get out of my mind. So at one point, I literally stopped praying, and I said, wait, I'll get to you after. Let me pray for the people who are dead, and then I'll pray for you later. And I continued. Well, I did finish the rosary. I, I prayed for her, but she kept at me the whole time that I was praying the rosary. I got a call the next morning from my mother telling me that that particular aunt had passed away. So I said, oh, do you know when she passed away? And she told me the time that she passed away was right while I was praying that rosary. And the special meaning it had for me was not just that she was basically reaching out to me to pray for her. By my mother, when I told the story to my mother, she said, 
wow, she says that's really something because she had turned away from the church and she wasn't really practicing her faith at that time. So it really struck me and I thought, wow, what an impact to be able to pray for these people and especially somebody who now was reaching out basically and saying, please pray for me. So that would probably be the charism that I, that I think about most or put most to use, I would say. Advent is approaching. I want to prepare my heart for the coming of the Lord Jesus by silence and recollection of spirit, uniting myself with the Most Holy Mother and faithfully imitating her virtue of silence, by which she found pleasure in the eyes of God himself. I trust that by her side, I will persevere in this resolution. During Advent, a great yearning for God arose in my soul. My spirit rushed toward God with all its might. During that time, the Lord gave me much light to know his attributes, and I understood that the greatest attribute is love and mercy. It unites the creature with the Creator. This immense love and abyss of mercy are made known in the incarnation of the Word, and in the redemption of humanity. And it is here that I saw this as the greatest of all God's attributes. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And tune in next week as we talk about the Immaculate Conception of Mary, something we Marian fathers of the Immaculate Conception hold dear in our hearts. So until then, keep asking for God's mercy, his most important attribute. And may he bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.